So good evening. So I'm gonna do that again. People who know me know I'm a fan of choirs, and so when I say good evening, let's do that in unison. Good evening. Good evening. It's cold out there, so we gotta warm this place up with our voices. It's always important <laughs> to speak who you are. In this place. So, you know, you know what? What do you say when? when you see a person like Nolan transformed in your very eyes, in front of your very eyes, the metamorphosis to perfection. As he said that I nourished his soul, I don't believe I didn't do anything but allow myself to be open for that to happen. And it's utterly important for us to be reflections over and against who we've been told about who we are. And to reflect back that that is not a, that is not our truth. And to see Nolan, I you know met Nolan four years ago. Now I'm going on five years. And to see him graduate from high school and to come to Northeast and win a full scholarship, to own his black gayness in a way that a lot of young black gay men struggle to be unapologetic about it, to show up and do the work it takes a lot of guts. So I say that to give Nolan another round of applause. So my name is Michael Robertson, and I have been in the house wall community for about 20, 21 years. I come out of Philadelphia, really Camden, New Jersey, which is the inner city across the bridge from Philly. It's real good. And um, you know, I, Cornel West has a new book called Black Prophetic Fire. One of the things he talks about is somebody loved him. And besides the fact that I know my mother, I came, I always tell people I theologized about my mother's womb. Because that was my very first glimpse of God. But Ballroom has loved me. Even when folks have told us we're not, Ballroom has loved me. And so I've been in the ballroom scene for 21 years. I moved, I do public health for a living. I moved to New York City to work specifically with black gay men in the house wall community in relationship to HIV prevention. Um, and then I was the executive director of one of the largest black gay agency, people of color crisis. And in that, we did some things. But I got fired in a very, very public way. And one of the things it allowed me to do was to go back to school. When I was moved to New York City, I was getting a master's in education, and I quit, and I don't quit anything. But I went back to school because I wanted to put theology in conversation with public health, because I never understood this notion of asking black gay men to be engaged in protective factors when they've been told the very essence of who they are is an abomination. And this narrative has to shift. And so I went back to school, got some degrees, blah, 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 blah. Why do I say this? Why do I bring this up? I am a believer that the ballroom scene, its history, is not only a theological discourse, not only a freedom movement, not only in conversation with other historical struggles, but first and foremost is a black trans woman's discourse. This is, a, this is a, a history of a community that comes out of the lens of black trans women. Over and against black church, Harlem, during Harlem, when it said, one of the things we'll talk about as we go through this is that Adam Clayton Powell, who was in charge of Abyssinian Church, created a three-decade campaign to get rid of black queerness in Harlem. And three ways that black gay folks and black queer folk have put queer in quotations, and I'll tell you why I put queer in quotations, because there needs to be a more deep analysis of what queer really means. But one of the reasons, one of three ways that black queers congregated in Harlem, was the saloon parties, I mean saloons, rent parties, and rent parties is nothing but, you know, you have a party to pay your rent, and drag balls, and drag balls become the largest movement. And we'll talk about its migration throughout the United States, and then it's morphing from drag ball to house ball, and then it morphing again through the South in relationship to sort of what I call black radical discourse in relationship to radical LGBT discourse. It has everything to teach queer theory, everything to teach queer theory, what queerness really is. But it has saved lives. 
And in this moment, when Nolan brought up, so in the space around Eric Gardner and Mike Brown, it has saved lives. And so we're going to talk about this discourse around Black Lives Matter. Then we have to talk about all black lives. And as black trans women have created this movement, and then today we're talking about black trans women continue to be murdered, all black lives have been So we're going to put this in this conversation. So one of the things we're going to do is, I'm going to do, we're going to do a couple of things. Not only are panelists going to be engaged in the conversation around their literary works in relation to the history of the Baldwin community, but we are going to look at a little bit of the history through what I call the hermeneutics of performance. I'm a believer that performance is a hermeneutics of the body. It's a text. It tells a story. It's contextual. So we're going to do that. I'm going to show a couple of categories because oftentimes when you ask people, people, the misnomer is that ballroom, you ask people about ballroom and think of Vogue, they think of Madonna. So we'll talk, we'll, we, we, will, we will demyth that. Uh, so we're going to do that. We're going to look at some categories. But so before that, I'm also, two things I'll mention real quickly. I am. I'm a, a member of this international sound art collective called Ultra Red. It's been around for 20 years. It uses sound art to in, interrogate systems of oppression. So I'm going to use an uh, Ultra Red protocol in during this, 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 this conversation. And the Ultra Red protocol is I'm going to show some clips. And I'm going to ask you to think about three things, because this is going to be an engaging conversation. I'm going to ask you to think about three things, real simple things. What did you hear? What did you see and what did you feel? What did you hear, what did you see, what did you feel? And so I am going to now put on some, some sound clips. No, they're all video clips. <clears throat> you may not think they have anything to do with ballroom, but I am going to put them ballroom in conversation with these clips. I'm going to ask you what you saw, what you felt. Then we're going to look at four videos. Two of them clean face. I'm going to contextualize them, or we're going to contextualize them, and two of both. And then we're going to engage the panelists in the history of the house wall community in relationship to their text. Is that okay? Ah, uh, here, is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm, yeah, the lights may need to come down a little bit more. I don't know, is it possible at all for those lights to come down to? Yeah, over here. Being a front runner in a lot of this work, people want to dismiss the truth that I speak as anecdotal. If I don't have a scientific database where I can prove that what I've experienced is true, for so many people, that is not true. So uh, the epistemological sea of forgetfulness is when people take truth that hurts, truth that goes to the core of the being, truth that goes to the marrow of the bone, and people want to say, if you can't prove it scientifically, factually, then it doesn't exist. So what I try to encourage people to do is that kind of truth that stings like a serpent's tooth that kind of truth that makes your teeth itch, the kind of truth that causes some people to lose their minds up in here, up in here. So even when people call your truth a lie, tell it anyway. Tell it anyway. Being a very attentive child, I started kindergarten when I was three, and so I was always concerned about race and justice. Because going to this kindergarten was a Lutheran kindergarten where we learned the Beatitudes and the Ten Commandments and all about sin and how much God loves us. And yet I could understand what black people have done. And this is a theological question of three. 
What we've done as black people, that we couldn't go to parks, we couldn't go to skating rinks, we couldn't go to the library, we couldn't go to anything except to church and the black school.